Hello, I am Scott Sears, senior pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Huntington, West Virginia. We are glad you are taking this time out of uh, your time to worship with us online. Uh, we want to welcome everyone to First Church. And if you want to find out more about us, you certainly can visit us on the web at firstunitedmethodistchurch.com or you can visit our Facebook page. We do ask that you take some time to subscribe to our videos so that you get updated videos when those do come out. Uh, over the past several months, we have been using, had been using a uh, text in church feature. We're no longer using that anymore. If you would uh, like to get in contact with us, visit our, our web page and use the contact page there. And you can also let us know via email there that you are watching and we're, we're glad that you're doing so. Um, some announcements that I'd like to share. I know that you watched many of those as they scrolled before the service, but I do want to remind everyone that this evening at, uh, on Sunday evening, the 25th, maybe that's this evening, maybe it's not, depending on when you're watching this. But on Sunday the 25th at 6 o'clock p.m., our choir and some other musicians are presenting a concert outside of the church on the 12th Street side of the church. We invite you to bring your own chair, bring what you need to stay warm. It might be a little chilly, uh, but come and enjoy this festival of music, this time for our singers to share some of their gifts and talents uh, with you as they bring glory to God. Other announcements will be scrolling at the end of the services as well, the online service. So take some time to watch those so that you'll know what's going on in the life of First Church. Right now, I invite us all to a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Mighty God in Christ, Jesus Christ, you dealt with spirits that darkened minds or set people against themselves and others. Give peace to people who are torn by conflict, are cast down, or dream deceiving dreams. By your power, drive from our mind demons that shake confidence and wreck love. Tame unruly forces in us and bring us to your truth so that we may accept ourselves as good, glad children of your love known in Jesus Christ. We pray that all may go well with our family and friends and that they may be in good health, both physically and spiritually. Restore those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Eternal God, we rejoice with those who have received their desire to depart and be with Christ for that better life without sin and suffering. Bring us in your own time to the passage from life through death to that better life in sure and certain faith in the living Christ who promises to be with us always. We pray all these things, even as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Shauna Chambers. I am the Director of Children's Education at First Church, and I hope you all are doing great. Today, I want to talk to you all a little bit about something that I learned a couple years ago. And I think that we could apply it today, but I also think that we could apply it to our faith life as well. Okay, so there was this thing um, going around and it talked about grief. Do you know what grief is? Um, grief is an emotion that we go through or a thing that we feel whenever we are um, missing something. Um, it could be a person after we passed away, or it could be um, if we lost at a game and it was a really good game and it and like everything was on the line, maybe it was the championship um, and we were super sad or anything like that. So that is grief, okay? And um, it's like whenever you lose somebody that you love, um, it doesn't, that pain doesn't ever go away, but you don't get as sad as often unless something like whenever my mama passed away, um, certain um, smells brought brought her memory back and made me sad. So it's like whenever it first happens, so this is like grief, okay? So this is like what happened. It never goes away, all right? So you, um, you never not win that game. Um, that person doesn't come back or maybe it's a friendship that you might have lost, but, or maybe, you missed your elementary school teachers or um, you had to move schools and you missed a friend. All right, so that never ever goes away. All right, so at the beginning, this ball is really big. So it could hit it a lot easier. All right, so we feel that a lot more, okay? But as time goes on, our ball gets smaller. So it's harder for us to be super super sad it doesn't mean that we don't miss it or we don't wish that we could change something or anything like that it just means that um we're not as sad as what it used to be all right so it's kind of like last year when um it all first started we were missing our friends and all of that stuff and we missed out some of us missed out on a lot of things and it stunk. Some people couldn't play sports. Some people missed out on family vacations. It was really, really sad. It was like the first picture. It was like this, all right? And we were triggered all the time to get upset about it. But now that we're kind of like getting out of that, it's more like this. Now, what does this have to do with our faith life? Now, you see, I feel like this is Jesus. And this is my relationship with Jesus. Whenever I decide that I don't want to go to church, um, maybe I don't want to pray, or I don't read my Bible, I am this big. But whenever I do read my Bible, and I do spend time in prayer, and I do make sure that I go to church, I like this ball. And I hit that more often. And I get that connection with Jesus more often. And whenever that happens, I'm less likely to be angry. And I'm less likely to be upset. And it doesn't mean that hard times won't happen. But it means that I'll be able to take care of myself a little bit better. Because I'm reminded that Jesus will always take care of me. And that is what's awesome. So yes, bad things happen sometimes and it doesn't mean that we'll never forget we'll never forget what happened this past year and we're still going through it right now even though we're kind of getting out of how bad it was last year it still happened and we'll always remember that but it's going to get better and what better way to make it better it to make sure that we're coming to church and make sure that we're praying to God and make sure that we are, um, you know, doing our Bible readings or our little devotionals or stuff like that so we can grow in our faith. So whenever bad things happen, we can be like this ball and we can be hit all the time and we can get through it a lot easier, a lot easier than if we were, we had a smaller ball. Do you think we can do that? Cause I think we could. All right, let's pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you 
thank you for giving us little ways to be connected to you on a daily basis and help us find time in um, every single day for you so that whenever bad things happen and we get upset or we remember things that we wish didn't happen, we can find peace in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye, guys. The first scripture lesson today comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. And I'm reading from the Common English Bible. The next day, the leaders, elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem, along with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and asked, by what power or in what name did you do this? Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? A good deed that healed them? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I read the scripture lesson for 
this worship service's uh, sermon, I invite you to join me in prayer. Would you pray for me, even as I pray for us all? Lord, it's not by might, and it's not by power. And it most certainly is not by cleverness of human imagination that your word is read or proclaimed. But it is by your spirit. So may that spirit come now. May it rest upon each of us. May it work through all of us to bring us the presence of the living word, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. From John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand and the sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I give up my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pit. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me. I give up my life so that I can take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I give it up because I want to. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right to take it up again. I received this commandment from my Father. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't really remember which one of the girls it was that was a fan of Sherry and Lamb Chop when it was on TV, but one of them was. And I can remember us watching that show occasionally. Um, And most of you, or many of you at least, are going to hate me for what I'm about to do. Because that particular show had a um, song at the end of it. Almost every single episode, I think, that was the theme song or the closing song for the show. And it's also what has been declared one of the world's worst earworms ever. But it goes something like this. This is the song that never ends, and it goes on and on, my friends. Somebody started singing it, not knowing what it was, and they'll continue singing it forever just because this is the song that never ends, and it goes on and on. And I think you get the point, okay? It does go on and on and never ends. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering, even though Lamb Chop, if you're familiar with the show, was a cheap hand puppet, what in the world does this have to do with Jesus and the Good Shepherd? Well, it makes a lot of sense if you think about the context of this particular passage. If you think about where it sits in John's gospel. Yes, we've just read the Good Shepherd passage, but this whole thing, this passage is part of a larger reading, a reading that runs all the way from chapter 14 through the end of chapter 17, known as Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples. 
It can even include chapter 13, if you count John's account of the Lord's Supper there as well. This one whole long section of Jesus saying goodbye. Jesus took quite some time in giving this farewell address or discourse. In fact, some people not all that familiar with John's Gospel, who have seen movies based on this, movies based very closely on it, get to that point in the movie and often ask their friends, is he ever going to wrap this up? Because these many chapters um, are such a long, drawn out farewell speech that seems to go on and on. I'm very glad that in the midst of it, we have this story of the Good Shepherd, a reminder of who Jesus is, as well as a reminder of who we are. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. Jesus is the Good Shepherd. I know one time I, I served a church that uh, had a beautiful stained glass window that was well, almost directly behind the pulpit and table area in that church. It was called the uh, Good Shepherd window. But whenever I looked at it, I, I, I wondered about that name. Because this giant stained glass window showed Jesus, as a shepherd, no doubt, but holding one sheep. And I, to me, that particular window was misnamed. It should have been called the lost sheep window because Jesus was cradling in his arm this one lost sheep that he had gone out to find. Another verse about Jesus being a shepherd that is very familiar to us, but a misnamed window nonetheless. That is part of being the good shepherd. It is part of what Jesus meant by referring to himself as the good shepherd, looking for those who are lost. And that is very comforting for us to know and to remember that this is something that Jesus does. But it's also part of what's unsettling as well. Because in that same passage, Jesus says the shepherd leaves the 99 there in the wilderness in order to go, the, go and find that one lost sheep. So yeah, it's, it, it's good to know Jesus does that, but sometimes it's unsettling to us to think he might leave us alone. And yet, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, he never gives up on his sheep. He says he will keep calling them, will be with them, will never give up on them. I wonder how many of us are so faithful when, well, people begin making sheep noises around us. I wonder, those of you who are on social media, how many of you have uh, silenced a friend or unfriended or blocked someone in social media sometime in the last four years? The Good Shepherd doesn't give up on us like we tend to give up on others. In fact, Jesus realizes that we as people have differences of opinion and that those differences of opinion matter way much more to us than they're ever going to matter 
to Jesus. The other great reminder to us, not only that Jesus is the good shepherd, but the other great reminder found in this story is that we are all sheep. You and I. You and any other person. Any other person than me. We're all in the same place in God's kingdom as being sheep. We are all, all of us, to find a place here where we experience both the security and the intimacy of being in community. Because ultimately, that's what Jesus, the Good Shepherd, wants to provide us. We do that as we gather or as we share with one another online. We become a community, not perfect, but a group of people who are all among equals. I remember a, a story about a couple who had <clears throat> gone about looking for a new church. And they visited this one church several times and the pastor had spoken to them knew they were looking for a church but after several visits they finally said to the pastor you know what pastor we had left our last church because it just wasn't right and we were searching for the perfect church and we think we have found it right here so we'd like to join this church the pastor just shook her head and, uh, you know, kind of said, well, I'm afraid I, I can't let you do that. And the couple looked at her and said, well, what do you mean you can't let us do that? And she says, well, you know, if I let you join, then it wouldn't be perfect anymore. We can be vulnerable. We can be real. We can be who we are as God's sheep, Jesus' sheep, without the pressure of being perfect, because Jesus is. Jesus had the right to lay down his own life and take it up again, because he was the only one who could do that in our place. On top of that, Jesus reminds us in this passage that there are wolves and even hired hands who might be dangerous to us sheep. And there are lots of dangers in this world, this world we sometimes refer to as our home. There was another, at least one more, mass shooting this week. There's the problems of racism and privilege that have been, well, right in front of us all the time, but have been brought to the forefront by events in Minneapolis this week. There's the danger of becoming marginalized because well, simply because. Yet Jesus calls us to be one flock, one group of sheep, all of us, as a community of faith. He calls us to do that, I think especially as United Methodist, as we remember our own vows of membership our vows to support the church with our prayers, knowing that we can never pray too much for our sisters and brothers in faith, even as we pray for everything else going on in the world. We remember our vow of presence, meaning that we will be with one another, perhaps in worship, perhaps online in community, and perhaps, most importantly, 
in small groups that care for one another, that bear one another's burdens, and that help each other grow into this flock Jesus wants us to be. We remember our vow of being faithful with our gifts, meaning that we will give to the church and support it with the finances God has entrusted to us. Remember, uh, the way you make the church important to you is by giving to it. You don't give to the church because it's important to you. But instead, you make the church important to you by giving to it. Because remember what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Jesus knew us very well and, and knew those things that uh, we give our money to become important to us. So we remember that vow, our prayers, presence, gifts, our service, not only to one another in those small groups, but also our service to those in this world who need the help that Jesus and Jesus' kingdom can provide. And finally, we make a vow to use our witness, to use our words as well as our actions, to show the whole world that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Jesus calls us to be one flock through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And as the United Methodist part of that flock, we should be doing that faithfully. I know that uh, someone a few weeks ago gave a definition of what a good sermon is supposed to be. A really good sermon is supposed to have a great beginning and a great ending, and the two of those should be as close together as possible. Yet, Jesus is the good shepherd. And he says that right in the midst of one of the longest speeches recorded in the Gospels, his farewell discourse. And I think, I think I know why Jesus took so long. Why Jesus went on and on with his farewell. This gathering, this bringing together of the sheep, this gathering of the flock is not going to be over until Jesus says, it is over. It won't be finished until, well, this gathering truly is the song that never ends. Until Jesus puts an amen to the end of it.
We want to thank each and every person who uh, gives of their gifts and of the uh, things God has given them to be stewards of that help support the ministry of First Church here in Huntington. We thank you for you, you have faithfully given through the mail by dropping off gifts at the church and by having your bank send money to our church. We, we appreciate all those ways that you have given and will continue to give. Uh, we do want to take time now, though, to thank God that we have the opportunity to give, even as we give thanks for the gifts themselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. Thank you that you have entrusted us with so much uh, and uh, we thank you, Lord, that we are able to give to your kingdom by giving to this church. Bless the gifts that are given, Lord, and bless those who give them. May all be used for the work of your kingdom. For this we pray in your name, O Christ, and amen.
Would you receive this benediction? Wherever you go, may God go with you. And whatever you need, may God provide. Whenever you stumble, may God lift you. And when, at the end of your days, you lay yourself down for the last time, may God raise you up for all time. Amen.